time Debbie did this, but um, I put this up and I was thinking, I was looking at different land acknowledgement statements and I worked with my assistant dean today to put this together. Um, and then I thought there was, at the University of Lethbridge, they had a picture of uh, some artwork and I started looking through um, what was available on the internet for this. And I like this picture of Niagara Falls and this family and the, and the artwork and the, of the women's clothes. It's quite amazing. And I, guess I said to Cindy and Terry before the talk, what's significant for me too is the child with their parents <laughs> and not at a residential school. Um, this is from the 19th century, this, uh, this, um, this picture. Um, so this series, what we've done is we've talked about um, coming of age. This is Ron, uh, Ron Clavier's um, thoughts about the wellness of learning and learning as a gift that frees people to change their minds about personal situations and gives them hope that, bring, that things can indeed improve. I guess I would add to my authors of the book, we feel that knowledge is the accelerator or magic bullet of having a good uh, life uh, and living long. Um, so tonight we're talking about risk of dementia. Ron talked about emotional wellness of learning. And then on the 14th, uh, Sam Thrall, who's a geriatrician, will talk about aging well. So I've got some learning objectives for tonight. Um, we're going to try and demystify what is happening as we live longer. Outline how to increase what we call brain ability or the risk of dementia. And demonstrate while ageism is alive and active, we can develop a plan to keep us doing what we love. And then we're going to, as Cindy said, we're going to have some group discussion. Uh, we're really keen to have you talk to your neighbors about some of the things we praised today or tonight. And uh, that's, that's the plan. Um, and uh, the other thing that in the, the, the description of what we're going to do tonight, uh, talked about the confusion between relationships, uh, aging and dementia and dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to try and tease that out. And um, the errors that sustain people, the errors that um, all we need is a magic bullet to sort out uh, Alzheimer's. But we think that uh, risk reduction is, a, is an, a very important topic. And we'll, we'll talk about that later today or tonight. Um, so this is a picture of a, of a tidal wave or a tsunami. And this is what's happening with uh, people over 80, but the whole, our whole population is expanding at an unbelievable rate of the, the group that are older adults. And um, what we're trying to do tonight is explain what some of us, um, how we interpret the science of what is happening when we live longer. Um, and uh, something we're gonna come back to at different times, but. If you look at the numbers here, you'll see that uh, there's no way that Ontario, for example, can produce enough long-term care homes to accommodate all the people in the province. Um, so we have to find other ways to prevent us having even to go to homes, which is what we're talking about. So living longer better requires three things, increasing activity, both physical or among uh, physical, cognitive and emotional, and uh, increasing the health span or compressing the period of dependency, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then reducing the need for health and social care. Like I said, we want to, the whole population talks about wanting to stay at home as long as possible. That's the consensus out there. And so that's what's really important to think about when we're talking about reducing risk. So this is an interesting chart, the way we, we think about... Um, using uh, a lot of data we have in the, in the province with healthcare records and other things, surveys, et cetera. But it's to think about um, these, these, these two bars. The, the bar represents the, our, our time around the world when we're living here. Um, and uh, we live for quite a while. And then we have a period at the end, the, the blue box, if you want to call it that, a duration of multimorbidity or, or high dependency. And um, what we'd like to do in the future, another way to think about risk reduction, is that we want to expand what uh, scientists call the health span um, and then reduce that box to a rectangle. So that's, that's the way we think about um, 
that's one way we think about risk reduction. This, this is another um, version of that where we have these two, two um, uh, lines. And the one at the top is uh, a, a type of situation for an individual that we'd like to avoid. There are, there are periods throughout that person's life where they're, they're hospitalized and their function isn't um, uh, optimal. And then what we'd like to do is, and you see under, in, under that line, they're at home a fair, way, a fair amount of time, but that, this arrow, the red arrow, shows that they're in care for quite a, quite a few weeks, months, or years. So that's not a very good situation. So the aim is to also have greater resilience so that acute care is less likely to be needed when a challenge occurs, such as a chest infection. So in the bottom bar, we see that this is a, this is a person who's um, taken on the kinds of risk reduction things we're going to talk about tonight. And you'll see that they have fewer times when they're, they're not at optimal functioning. They are fewer hospitalizations. And they're able to live at home right to the end of their life with maybe only six days of a caregiver coming to their home. That's success. <laughs> and we'd all like to be able to do that. So I'm going to talk about this um, concept for a while. Um, this is our scientific understanding of what's happening as we live longer. Um, on the left-hand side there, there's a bar that's, that's ability. Um, as you go up the bar, your ability increases. As you go across the lower um, axis, age increases. Um, and uh, the, way, the way we, we uh, develop as individuals is there's a turning point um, depending on the, whether it's physical or emotional or um, mental functioning, um, where we start to decline. And that, that may be at different times for different characteristics and different types of things for the individuals. And we think about that line after that turning point as, as the question about, well, what, what's the best possible rate of decline as we age? We are going to be declining, but what's the best possible rate? So um, we call that that um, line after the turning point as, um, as the best possible rate or the actual rate of decline. And the difference between those two lines on the right, the declining lines, is what we call the fitness cap. So regaining fitness should be accompanied by two processes, uh, two other processes of disease and, and, and negative thinking. But um, people in age 50, 70, or 83, or more chronological age, differ from one another more than they resemble one another, but have had the experience, for example, of uh, um, some music in their teens before growing up and, and, and changing. And, um, and we also know that uh, um, we, we have uh, different rates of decline depending on who we are. So... What we're talking about is this lower line. If, if sometimes after we start to decline, we make a decision to um, do some training, whether that's um, mental or physical training. And by doing that, we, we narrow the fitness gap. And um, that's the, that, of course, takes some, a fair amount of support and, and, and uh, assistance. People can't do that themselves, and we'll talk about that later. So this is another, another way to think about it. Um, we've drawn a horizontal line there called the line. And that's the level required to get to the toilet in time. <laughs> and uh, this is off, often an, uh, a decision point that people have to make when they are admitted to a long-term care home or when they're in hospital, et cetera. And um, so the best possible on that upper uh, declining line, you see, We've called it the best possible rate of decline after onset of heart failure. And then with the onset of heart failure, often the rate of decline is, um, it speeds up after you've had that event. So we need to, we need to find ways to, um, to uh, have the resilience of the capacity to not have that happen as severely as other people. And we'll talk about that as well. So that's, those are, this is the other, this is another way of thinking about risk. And then finally, we've got um, 
the uh, this this idea of, for example, physical activity, where we know that um, that uh, we can we can we can reduce this rate of decline before we have the heart attack, and then you'll see that there's not as much of a need for us to to um, do more physical activity, etc., because we've been doing it all our life. So what we're left with then is um, these four processes going on. We're aging, we're losing fitness, we have negative thinking about things, and we have disease. And this starts, one way to think about it is when we, when we finish uh, high school or at least, um, or, or university, what do we do? We get a job, and then we sit in the car and drive to the job. And we sit at the computer at the job until the end of the day, and then we get back in the car and, and drive uh, and and drive home, and then uh, we spend the evening watching Netflix. So that's that's an environmental thing or a, a lifestyle that we have very large part of the population, and um, this is this environmental effect is is causing our whole our whole community to lose its collective fitness. So we have to think about ways of changing that. So what we're going to talk about tonight is um, understanding aging, which is what we've just been doing, um, how we can regain our fitness, physical, cognitive, and emotional, um, the importance of preventing or tackling disease, and thinking positively. Uh, this is a... a a report that the World Health Organization released last month on, on ageism. It's out there. It's alive and well. On the right-hand side is this picture of a glass half full and half empty. And um, the negative people see life as always half empty. And other people that see um, life as a positive thing see as a, a, the glass is half full. And so what we want to do is um, try to avoid this as much as we can. As we age, and um, if we're younger and we have ageist attitudes, um, maybe we can imagine what it's like when you get older when, it's, when you're the recipient of these, um, these kinds of um, behaviors and the way, think, the way people think about older adults. So that's the, that's the introduction. Now, um, I've given you a few hints, but what we want to do now is um, uh, have a two-minute question. And that's this question, how do we increase our brain ability and reduce our risk of dementia? You must have had some ideas before you came in. And so what I'd like you to do is talk to your neighbor for two minutes, and then we'll put some of your answers up on the whiteboard. So um, if you could talk to your neighbor about how do you think you should, how, how can you increase your brain ability or reduce your dementia? So I'll get my phone out and we'll start. So it's six fifty. One minute to go. Okay, uh, two minutes are up. Could I have um, some of your thoughts? What are what are what are some of the things? What did you guys talk about? 
Reading? Pardon? Socializing? Um, someone on that side? Okay. Anything else? Yes, at that thing? Okay. Well, we don't have time to go through everything, but you see one of the things, some of the things people are talking about. Now I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Melanie, or sorry, yeah. Madeline. Madeline, sorry, can't think. I got, uh, it's, a, it's an aging moment here. <laughs> Yeah, you can touch this. Oh, it goes like this. I have a copy. This way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Uh, so those are all some really great ideas. In fact, I think probably collectively you could give this part of the presentation too. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to continue uh, uh, talking about how to reduce the risk of dementia. Uh, so first, it's important to uh, understand the relationships between dementia, uh, vascular dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. So dementia is an overarching condition uh, that can be caused by a lot of different, different things, including vascular dementia um, and, and, and Alzheimer's, which are the two big ones. Uh, so, um, vascular dementia can be caused by loss of blood flow uh, to the brain, um, which causes certain brain tissue to not work as well, leading to dementia, whereas Alzheimer's is a disease of an unknown cause. And of course, as you look at this Venn diagram here, you can see there can be overlap between the two. And there's also um, some people with Alzheimer's disease may not even have uh, symptoms of dementia. Uh, so there is a lot of confusion out there um, about what dementia is. So a lot of people think it is about confusion and memory loss, when really it is about the loss of um, ability to perform these four functions. Uh, so oh, uh, these four functions uh, include the ability, oh, sorry, uh, the ability to look after financial affairs, uh, self-care and personal hygiene. So for example, taking care of your medical conditions, like remembering to take your, the right pills at the right time, uh, cleaning and maintaining a living space, and then being able to drive safely. Uh, now, the really important thing to know about dementia uh, is that it's not inevitable. Uh, so there are three evidence-based strategies that we are going to talk about today uh, that you can implement to help reduce your risk of dementia and live longer better. And these strategies are keep your brain tissue healthy, improve blood supply, uh, to your brain and increase engagement with other people. Uh, and for each of these strategies, there are systematic reviews backing, uh, backing the strategies up. So systematic reviews are papers that summarize evidence from all the good quality studies out there. And if you want to learn more about these strategies and the research that went into developing them, uh, you can read Dr. Chambers' book, uh, which is uh, Increase Your Brain Ability and Reduce Your Risk of Dementia. And this book is intended for lay audiences. Uh, so the first step to our strategy to reducing the risk of dementia is protecting brain tissue. And uh, there are different ways that we can implement this strategy, um, including get more active and improve physical fitness, uh, reduce the impact of stress, sleep better, and be wary of over-medication. Uh, so first we are going to talk about getting more active and improving physical fitness. Uh, so here's a 70th birthday card that suggests what we should be buying when we reach that age. And it reads, thoughts of sending you new slippers or a woolly cardi or a comfy ejector chair. Uh, but we love you too much. So here is the best present, a resistance band. Use it every day. Uh, so physical activity has been described as a miracle cure uh, because it can help with many different conditions, including dementia. Uh, and here we have some... Uh, examples of different types of physical activity, including flexibility exercises like stretching, yoga, uh, and dancing, strength exercises like lifting weights, 
um, climb, climbing stairs, carrying supplies, and endurance activities like walking, uh, swimming, and racket sports. Uh, so the next way to uh, protect brain tissue is to reduce the impact of stress. Uh, and ways of doing this include managing your time, so splitting your day into chunks and take regular breaks, including a lunch break uh, that enables you to get a change of scenery. So for example, taking a brisk walk outside, uh, making lists of what you need to do and prioritizing them in order of importance. So focusing on those things that help you achieve your goals, uh, not falling prey to COVID-19 misinformation. So double check your sources and maintain a healthy level of suspicion. Um, when it comes from, to uh, information from unverified sources. Uh, prioritize regular exercise. So again, the miracle cure. Um, so the fitter we feel physically, the better function that we'll have intellectually. Um, and in fact, uh, some doctors in Japan have started prescribing forest bathing as a way of uh, reducing, um, reducing stress. Uh, and then finally, uh, taking deep soothing breaths when you are under stress and simple behavioral modification techniques uh, can also be done. Uh, so the third way to protect brain tissue is to get adequate sleep. And you may be wondering, am I on the right track with my sleep? Uh, and ways of gauging this uh, include whether or not you can say yes to the following statements. So I am getting between seven to nine hours of sleep each night. I do not wake up during the night more than once. I am able to go to sleep most nights. And I do not sleep during the day. Uh, so if this isn't the case for you, uh, there are some routines that can help you with your sleep that are on the board here. Uh, so get up at the same time each morning, even on weekends, uh, regardless of when you go to sleep. Uh, develop relaxing pre-sleep rituals, specifically ones that help you avoid screen time before bed. Uh, so for example, reading. Uh, avoid certain beverages. So obviously caffeinated beverages should be avoided, such as pop, tea and coffee, but also alcohol. Uh, now, some people may be using alcohol to help fall asleep, and while it may help initially with that, overall it decreases your quality of sleep overnight. Uh, so caffeine and alcohol should be avoided within six hours of bedtime. Uh, and the last thing that can help you with your sleep is the miracle cure, uh, physical, ex uh, physical activity. Uh, for sleep, though, uh, it shouldn't be done right before sleeping, so vigorous exercise should be done in the morning, and then more mild exercise should be done at least two to three hours uh, before bedtime. The final way uh, to protect brain tissue is to be wary of over-medication. Uh, so dementia is caused by medications in one in five people. And a story of how this, hap how this can happen is, uh, this, um, is the story of Betty, who as an 86-year-old was ma uh, misdiagnosed with di uh, dementia. Uh, and this uh, story was first reported in a CBC article. Uh, so Betty was an active 86-year-old who was first prescribed an antibiotic for an ear infection. Uh, she then had swollen legs uh, and a cataract surgery and was given drugs for both of these conditions. Um, after that, she was given another drug for ongoing pain in her ear. Uh, and then uh, she, on top of that, she was taking ibuprofen uh, for the pain um, in her leg and her ear. So once taking all these medications, she started experiencing confusion uh, and she felt like she had noises in her head that she described like Niagara Falls. Uh, she also started acting in ways that she had never acted before. Uh, so she was concerned about all this and went to her family doctor. Um, but instead of looking at her medications, the doctor um, administered a cognitive test, which led to her license, uh, her driver's license being uh, revoked. Uh, so Betty knew that she wasn't incompetent, and she started Googling uh, all the drugs that she was on. And eventually she realized that, they were, uh, that all their symptoms were the result of a drug reaction. Uh, she stopped taking her medications, and in about 10 days she was fine. Um, she ended up taking another cognitive test uh, to prove she was of sound mind and a driving test to get her license back, but unfortunately, she had to pay for both. Uh, so we finished talking about how to protect brain tissue, uh, and the second strategy to help reduce your risk of dementia is to keep the arteries open. So the brain is full of blood vessels. Uh, in fact, there are over 400 miles of blood vessels in the brain that cover the surface area of a tennis court. Um, and while the brain is only 2.5% of the body's weight, uh, it is obviously a very important organ, and it therefore receives 15% of the blood flow and 25% of the body's total oxygen consumption. 
So given how important it is then for blood to reach the brain, anything that reduces or interrupts blood flow uh, can cause strokes or mini strokes, uh, which can damage brain tissue and lead to uh, dementia, uh, particularly uh, vascular dementia. So the good news is that vascular dementia is very preventable. So again, the miracle cure, physical activity, uh, not smoking, maintaining a healthy weight, uh, and consuming a Mediterranean diet are all ways to help keep good blood flow to the brain. And on the left here, we have medical conditions that can impede blood flow to your brain, brain uh, like high blood pressure, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, high cholesterol, uh, and atrial fibrillation. But again, the good news is that these health conditions are preventable uh, through the lifestyles on, the, on, on your left. Um, and if you think that one of these conditions may be of concern to you, you can see a family physician. Uh, so the third and final strategy to reduce the risk of dementia that we are going to talk about today uh, is to keep engaged and purposeful. Uh, but before we do so, we're going to do another two-minute uh, discuss with your neighbor. So um, take a couple minutes to discuss with your neighbor how um, you think uh, we can keep engaged and purposeful. Yeah, so we have golfing, uh, so socializing, um, physical activity, uh, we have, and stress reduction. Uh, we have volunteering, uh, we have giving to others, um, and we have um, like keeping your mind's eye uh, focused on others, uh, and uh, giving friends a call, uh, and avoiding negative thinking. Uh, so those are all some really great ideas. Uh, so certain mental powers uh, peak earlier in life. So for example, information processing, speed, and short-term memory. Uh, but other mental powers uh, peak later in life. Uh, so for example, emotional understanding uh, peaks in your 40s and 50s. Um, vocabulary abilities will continue to increase into your 60s. Uh, and crystallized intelligence uh, peaks in your 60s and 70s. Uh, and this is um, your accumulated knowledge uh, and facts about the world um, that can be otherwise known as wisdom. Uh, so going back to the fitness graphs that Dr. Chambers used earlier in the presentation, where ability is on the uh, vertical y-axis and then age is on the horizontal x-axis, uh, we can see here that um, people with more access to education growing up have an advantage in that their turning point uh, for intellectual abilities is at a higher uh, peaks at a higher level of ability than someone with less education, and therefore um, people with more education will have a higher best possible rate of decline. Uh, and in fact, um, some research has shown that um, a high school education can be protective, is protective against dementia. Uh, so the next slide uh, shows the fitness gap. So like physical activity, or sorry, physical ability, uh, certain um, 
there is some decline in intellectual abilities that occurs due to aging. However, most people decline uh, more quickly than what is just due to aging, and this is the fitness gap. Um, but at any age, this gap can be narrowed by increasing intellectual activity. Uh, so people who cannot see or hear well um, often become socially isolated and deprived of stimuli, uh, which help keep, which, that keep the brain cognitively engaged. Uh, so these things can, um, hearing and visual loss can help, can contribute to dementia. Uh, so um, these uh, vision, visual and hearing loss, these can both be prevented. Uh, and if these are already an issue, um, assistive devices can be used to help augment vision and hearing. Uh, and if you think this might be of concern to you, you can uh, see an audiologist. Uh, so a model of someone who managed to keep engaged and pur purposeful and live successfully uh, in their later years is Ed, who at 88 years old managed to keep focused on the aspects of his life that were most important to him. Uh, this included caring for his dog, Charlie, uh, and taking newspapers and garden produce uh, to the care home uh, staff where his wife, uh, Norma, lived during the last two years of her life. Uh, so Ed would visit Norma daily at the care home and was well-liked in his circle of friends and relatives uh, because of his dry sense of humor, uh, his positivity, uh, and his philosophical attitude. Uh, he had a can-do approach uh, to issues and problems, and this contributed to his ability to live independently uh, in the three years uh, after normal was not around. Uh, Ed was always curious. Uh, he researched new seeds, uh, new seed companies, and new and different approaches to nurturing plants. Uh, he donated much of his garden produce to his family and friends. And while Ed was never a formal community leader holding a position, um, he nevertheless participated in local events. Uh, he remained able to live alone successfully. Uh, so he was able to detect suspicious phone calls uh, and it was able to work with uh, tradespeople around the house. Uh, so to summarize um, all the ways that we can keep engaged and purposeful, um, keeping your sight and your hearing sharp, uh, stay mentally alert by learning new hobbies, reading or solving crossword puzzles, uh, and stay involved social, socially. Uh, so attend community activities like you all are doing today, um, or faith groups or support groups. And now I'm gonna turn it back, or, to uh, Dr. Chambers. So the, the, the take-home uh, messages, um, basically we need a revolution to get rid of ageism. Um, and that's not me saying, many of my colleagues say that. Um, the normal aging process is not a cause of major problems until your 90s. Um, you can regain physical fitness, so that's the really good news that we're talking about tonight by getting on with things um, like that. Uh, we can reduce the, the risk of dementia uh, significantly. The estimate now is we can reduce by about 40% versus that new drug that's on the market, um, out of, out of, out of Colinet or something. Uh, it reduces risk by 4%. So, so um, the things we're talking about for risk reduction are, are quite significant and um, and scientifically based. Um, and finally, to think positively. So what we've done with our learning objectives, we've tried to help you better understand um, what is happening as we live longer. Uh, we've talked about reducing risk of dementia. Um, while ageism is alive and well, we can develop a plan to keep us going, doing what we love. So now I'm going to give you um, each, or maybe, um, Maybe uh, Madeline can do that. Um, each of you give a, a, give you each a page, a page which reviews these um, or includes these um, these uh, these exercises. There are three exercises. So what we want to do is assign you to probably four small groups, and then um, once you get in your group, if you can identify a facilitator and recorder, because we're going to we're going to have you report back uh, when you've. Uh, your group work because I was going to look at my time. So it's 7.14, so we're supposed to be out of here at, at, um, at 8. So why don't we go to quarter to 8 with your small group? So we'll see how it goes. We'll be watching how you do this. And so you're starting to read the, 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 assign, the exercises. So the first exercise is what sources of support are there for people to protect their brain tissue? 
And so the brain tissue, the, the, the types of things we want to protect are listed under that question. But the, the discussion in the group can be, should be about, well, what can you do as an individual? How can your friends and family help you with, with this, these, these four things? What's being done in the community where you can, where you can seek help? And then finally, as a last resort, go to the health service for getting support on how you can do that. The next exercise is what are the sources of support are, are there for you if you want to keep your arteries open? And as uh, uh, Madeline said, there are these four um, uh, lifestyle kinds of things, and then there's the four, four conditions or five conditions. So what can you do about these? What can your friends, friends and family do? What's available in the community to help you deal with these? And is the health service going to be helpful? And what, what would that be? And then finally, the last exercise is about what sources of support on the, the back of the page are, are, are there for people who want to keep engaged and purposeful? Keeping your sight and hearing sharp, staying mentally alert, uh, staying so, involved socially. So what can you do about this? What can your friends and family do about this? What's in the community to help you do this? And um, what can the health service do about this? So what I thought I would do is ask you to say, say out loud the numbers one, two, three, and four. And that'll be the group assignments. I think, I think we could have four groups. What's the number here? Um, OK, so that means there'll be about five people in a group. So do um, you want to be in a group? Okay, one, two, three, 